Okay, so welcome to this next video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the different types of uh, mutation that can occur to uh, the DNA within your cells. Okay, so we're going to discuss the types of mutation. Okay, right, so the structure then for this video, what we're going to start off with is we're going to start off with a revision of the central dogma of biology because that's really essential to understanding the different types of mutation and how they're going to affect the protein, okay? Uh, so we're going to start off with that and then we'll move on to defining what a mutation is firstly and then looking at the different forms of mutation and the effect that they can have on the protein that's being produced by the gene. Okay, right. So let's start off then with the central dogma of biology. So let's let these two parallel strands here represent a piece of double-stranded DNA. Okay, so we have the two DNA strands here which are complementary to one another. Now, let's say that this portion that I am now outlining uh, with this box here, okay, let's say that this is going to be a gene, so I'll outline this in blue here. Okay, so this is some gene within the um, genome. Okay, so here is our gene. Now, uh, one of the strands of this double-stranded piece of DNA within this gene is going to actually be the portion that is used by RNA polymerase 2 to synthesize a piece of mRNA. Okay, so we'll colour in this purple strand here, and we'll say that this is the one that's actually going to be used by RNA polymerase 2 to produce a piece of mRNA. This strand is known as the coding strand. Okay, the strand that's not then going to be used by RNA polymerase 2 to produce a piece of mRNA from, that's known as the non-coding strand. So I'll colour in the non-coding strand in turquoise here. Okay, so RNA polymerase 2 will never work its way along this strand to produce the gene, uh, to produce a piece of mRNA, um, which will then go on to be translated into a piece of protein. Okay, right. So, what's then going to happen is when you want to produce a piece of mRNA from uh, this gene, the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, which is often abbreviated to RNAP2, like so, it's going to come over, it's going to split these two strands apart, it's then going to work its way along the coding strand of the gene, okay, and it's going to synthesize a piece of mRNA that is complementary to that coding strand here. So this portion in green, this represents this piece of mRNA that's going to be complementary to that coding strand. Okay, so let's bring this piece of mRNA out here. Okay, so once again I'll colour it in green. Now, the initial piece of mRNA that you produce uh, is not ready to be translated yet. This is what's known as a pre-mRNA, okay? And um, what has to happen to this pre-mRNA is it has to go through certain post-transcriptional modifications, one of which is that it needs to undergo splicing. Okay, so let's just talk about splicing for a moment. So basically, there are portions of the pre-mRNA that are not actually supposed to be translated into protein, okay? So the portions that are actually supposed to be translated into protein are known as the exons. So let me box some of these regions here. So this portion, this portion, and this portion here. We'll say that those are all actually supposed to be translated into um, a polypeptide sequence. Okay, so these portions are going to be called the exons. So let's colour in the exons in orange here. Okay, so this is an exon here, this is an exon here, and this is an exon here. Okay, so these are the exons. So, uh, the portions that are in between the exons that are not actually supposed to be translated, so all of these four portions that are not boxed, this portion here, and finally this portion here, these are known as the introns. These are not supposed to be translated. Now, in the process of splicing, what's going to happen is you're going to cut the introns out, and then you're going to re-sew together the exons to make a shorter piece of mRNA that now just consists of the exons joined together. Okay, and this shorter piece of mRNA that just consists of the exons joined together, this is the mature mRNA. 
Okay, and this can now go for a ribosome and be translated into a protein. So it will now go through the process of translation and then you'll end up with a protein. Okay, right. So let's now just go through this in a bit more detail. So that's the big picture of the central dogma of biology, how we go from having a gene which has all the information we need to make the protein to actually having a protein. Okay, but I want to look at this in a bit more detail. So we'll start by looking at a little section of our gene in a little bit more detail here. Okay, so let's draw this bigger now. So we've just cut out a little section. So I'll highlight this in not pink, uh, but red, because pink won't show up because the coding strands in vivid purple and pink and purple are too similar. Okay, so we're cutting that red portion out and we're drawing it now bigger. Okay, so here are these two strands of DNA. Okay, so one is the coding strand in vivid purple here, and then the other in turquoise here is the non-coding strand. Okay, and they're going to have a complementary sequence of organic bases. So let's just make up a sequence just to illustrate the point. So um, what should we have? We'll have an adenine organic base, a thymine organic base, a cytosine organic base. Let's say we have another cytosine organic base, a guanine organic base. And let's say finally we have an adenine organic base. Okay, right. And then on the complementary strand, we'll have the complementary organic bases. So the complementary organic base to adenine is thymine. The complementary organic base to thymine is adenine. The complementary organic base to cytosine is guanine. Same again. The complementary organic base to guanine is cytosine. And the complementary organic base to adenine is thymine. Okay, so here's just a little sequence within our gene. Okay, right. Uh, now, what we're going to do then is we're going to produce our piece of mRNA. So let's show that occurring. So what's going to happen is the two strands are going to come apart, okay? And you are going to produce a piece of mRNA that's complementary to your coding strands. So let's show that here. So here again is the sequence of organic bases on this little section of the coding strand that we are looking at here. Okay, so we'll colour this once again in purple, which is the colour we had it in that bigger picture up there. And we're now going to produce a piece of mRNA uh, here, which is this pre-mRNA that we're initially producing. Okay, and we'll colour this in in green down here. Now this will have a complementary sequence of organic bases to uh, the coding strand here. Okay, but you have to remember that mRNA does not have thymine. Okay, it replaces thymine with uracil. So, let's ask, what are we going to put in this first position here? Well, we need something that's complementary to adenine. The complementary organic base that you use to adenine in RNA is uracil. Okay, the complementary organic base to thymine is adenine. The complementary organic base to cytosine is guanine. Again, guanine. And we've got another cytosine here. Oh, well, our first cytosine, so our complementary organic base to guanine is cytosine. And then again, we've got this question of what's the organic base that's complementary to adenine, which is used in RNA, that's uracil. Okay, right. And then we'll just complete this picture by putting the complementary sequence uh, of DNA here, which is on this non-coding strand. Okay, so just copying this um, sequence that we had here out. Okay, so there's our non-coding strand uh, in turquoise here. So we've produced our piece of mRNA. Let's just label everything up. So this is our piece of mRNA here. Remember, this is the pre-mRNA. Uh, then we've got our coding strand here in uh, purple. And then at the base in turquoise, what we've got is the non-coding strand. Okay, now what's going to happen is uh, the mRNA is going to get spliced, okay, so certain portions are going to be cut out, okay, and we'll then end up with our mature mRNA, so let's say we've got our mature piece of mRNA here. Now, let's just make up a sequence for our mature mRNA. That shows the principle of us uh, transcribing the DNA into the um, mRNA. Now, let's have a look at translation. Okay, so let's have our mRNA here, and this will have a sequence of organic bases. So let's make something up here. So we've got A, G, C, and now I'm going to need an important one, A, U, 
G we'll put there and then actually I'd just like to to highlight a point I'll put a um, U there as well okay uh, then we'll have C C A etc okay so this is our piece of mRNA okay right so here is our piece of mature mRNA that is ready to now be translated into proteins let's now go over the uh, basics of translation okay so what's going to happen is uh, the mature mRNA is going to go through a ribosome so let's draw our ribosome here okay so this is our ribosome here and what's going to happen is we're going to insert the mature mRNA into the ribosome and it's going to read the mature mRNA basically so the mRNA will slide through and it will not start the process of building a um, piece of protein that is um, the, the, for which the sequence of organic base, uh, oh, sorry, of amino acids in the protein is determined by the sequence of organic bases of the mature mRNA until it finds a start codon. Okay, so what will happen is the mature mRNA will come in here and it will scan along until it finds a start codon. Now, what is the start codon? Well, basically, well, firstly, what's a codon? So, a codon is uh, a combination of three neighboring organic bases okay so free organic bases so the mRNA is not uh, read um, looking at single organic bases instead you look at triplets of organic bases okay and a triplet of organic bases is called a codon okay so the start codon is whoops not like that uh, the start codon is AUG so it will work its way along until it finds a sequence which is AUG now I have purposefully included one of those here okay and once it gets to that start codon what it will do is it will begin the process of translation so here is our mRNA now it's ignored this bit upstream of the start codon so this UAGC we're ignoring that portion okay and it's it's only starting once we actually get to this first start code on here, the AUG. Okay, right. So, it's now found this start code on, and it's now going to begin the process of translation with this start code on here. Okay, right. So now what's going to happen is you are going to bring in amino acids, okay? And the amino acid that you bring in is going to be determined by the sequence of organic bases on the mRNA. However, it is not the case that the mRNA, sorry, that the ribosome just looks at the single organic bases and says, right, for this single organic base, we'll pair this amino acid, this one will have this amino acid. Instead, what it does is it looks at combinations of free organic bases. So it looks at free organic bases it looks at that sequence and then says what amino acid should I put in for that sequence of free uh, organic bases okay and this concept of using triplets of organic bases is the concept of the triplet code basically okay so uh, we've started the process then of translation with this first codon this first sequence of free organic bases which is a UG. Now, what amino acid corresponds to this start codon here? I'm just going to label this up as the start codon. Well, basically, it's the amino acid methionine. Okay, so uh, let me just remind you of the structure of methionine. So I'll draw a methionine down here. Okay, so the structure of methionine then is here it's, is its amino group. So I'll start by drawing the core amino acid structure. Here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon, and then also coming off the alpha carbon, we have the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, right. Now, the R group of a methionine amino acid consists of an ethylene group, which is basically just two methylene groups joined together. Okay, like so. Then you have a sulfur atom, and then coming off this sulfur atom, you then have a methyl group, like so. Okay, so this is the structure of a methionine amino acid. Okay, right. So this is the amino acid that we're going to put in uh, for AUG here. So how does this actually occur? Well, what's going to happen is we're going to bring in molecules known as tRNAs. Okay, 
So, let's just explore what the concept of a tRNA is. So, a tRNA, I'll draw like so, okay? Uh, just like in this shape. That's not actually what it looks like, but for our purposes, this will be an adequate um, cartoon for it. Okay, now, a tRNA, then, stands for transfer RNA. So, that's what the little T is for. It's for transfer, okay? And it is a piece of RNA um, that has a uh, exposed sequence of free organic bases that are capable of fitting in and binding to free organic bases on um, the mRNA uh, that's being read by the ribosome. Okay, so it has a display, if you like, free organic bases here. Okay, now, um, for AUG, the display of free organic bases that we are going to need on the tRNA in order that this tRNA will bind to that is going to need to be complementary to that. Okay, so this first one is going to be the complementary one for A, and we're still working with RNA here. Okay, so um, we're not going to have thymine, we're going to have uracil again. Okay, so here is our tRNA. Okay, so the first amino acid it's going to need to have there is a uracil. The second one is going to need to be an adenine, the complementary organic base for uracil. And then the third one is going to need to be C. Okay, so you can build many different tRNAs then, because you need to have one uh, organic base here, one here, one here. For each of those three slots, you have four different organic bases that can go here, four ones that can go here, and four that can go here. That means there's a total of 64 different combinations you could have there. Okay, now, the combination that is displayed here on the tRNA is known as the tRNA's anticodon. Okay, so, this is an anticodon, sorry, this is a tRNA with an anticodon that's complementary to the start codon. Okay, now, all tRNAs also get an amino acid attached to them, which I'll show down here. So this blob at the bottom here, this is going to represent the amino acid, and for short, alpha-alpha is often used to denote amino acid. Okay, right. Um, so, all tRNAs get an amino acid attached to them, and the amino acid they get attached to them is going to depend on what anticodon they have. Okay, so tRNAs which have this anticodon UAC, which is complementary to the codon AUG, the star codon, they are always going to get methionine amino acids attached. But tRNAs with different anticodons will get different uh, amino acids attached. Okay, so what's then going to start, well, the way we're going to start translation is that this tRNA which has an anticodon complementary to the start codon is going to come in here, okay, it's going to bring its methionine here, okay, and that then is going to start the uh, polypeptide, that's our first amino acid that we're going to put into the polypeptide.